Yeah. Well, after you go to Bible class, this is what the adults are going to watch. Well, because it's going to teach us a lesson from the Bible. Is that cool? Is that what Miss Carissa said? Yeah, she's right. She's pretty smart. Mm -hmm. That's him. That's that's a little hill. There you go. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Howdy, howdy. We're going to go ahead and get started this evening. Good to see everybody. few reminders of events that are coming up and other things to sign up for in the back on the skinny table is a sign-up list to help out with teaching kids' classes on Sunday morning. Uh, I think those are getting pretty filled up back there, but I think there's still a few slots. If you have any questions, talk to Nick or Holly. And they will be glad to answer your questions about that. Also, not this coming Sunday, but the one after that, that will be the fifth Sunday of the month. We're going to have a special giving. This is something that we are starting uh, with our special givings every fifth Sunday of the year. We're going to have some kind of special giving, so this will be our first one. And this one is going to go towards youth. We'll have our regular contribution, and then probably at the end we'll have another uh, collection. But this will go towards our youth, summer activities, LTC, Bible camps, uh, pretty much anything to do with youth. So be thinking about that, be praying about that, uh, what you would like to contribute Right. But not this fifth Sunday. Okay. Okay. Uh, that, that, that was well said, though. Yes. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is to try to help us keep organized a little bit, and, and that way uh, it gives everybody a chance to pray, uh, to plan ahead a little bit for these special givings as well. So not this Sunday, but, but the one after on the fifth Sunday. All right. Any other events we need to talk about? All right, prayer requests, prayer updates. Uh, the main one that I have, of course, concerns George Cummings, uh, son of uh, Benny and, and Pam. And uh, Benny called me this morning, and he gave me he gave me a pretty lengthy update on on George. Of course, he passed out yesterday. Was it day before? Day before he passed out at work. Uh, had a mini stroke. Ended up hitting his head pretty good, uh, which caused a blood clot uh, in his brain, which they were able to get. 
Then he said that there's a smaller clot that they couldn't get, but they're hoping medication will take care of that. He's going to be in ICU for at least the next couple of days. Uh, they're trying to keep his blood pressure up, but it keeps going down. Uh, he's also dealing with bacteria in the blood. So they are still doing testing, uh, checking his heart. Right now, his speech is slurred. He needs assist in walking. Uh, Benny said some of these things might affect him for the next year. He's going to, of course, need uh, some therapy to work with these things. Uh, one of the main things for him is going to be he won't be able to drive. Uh, Benny said that right now he has double vision in one eye as well. So he has a lot going on. So, so let's please keep George in our prayers. He's up in Denver. And, of course, Benny and Pam as well as they course are worried about their son all right any other any other updates work camp okay work work camp is coming up June 8th okay so Ben says, uh, with the work camp, kind of like last year, if you got some projects for the kids, there'll be a sign-up sheet in the back, and, and they would appreciate you signing up things for them to do. So, so if you have that opportunity, please, please do so. All right, anything else? All right, I'm going to start us off with a word of prayer, then we will dismiss the kids to their classes. Uh, Sam will have our singing tonight. Uh, our speaker is up on the board. He is patiently waiting uh, to get started. And uh, Chris will close us out tonight when that time comes. Let us pray. Holy Father, thank you for this night that you've given us that we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that you give us a cool building to, to be in, to be comfortable in. Uh, Father, we pray that you would be with all our teachers tonight. And Father, that you will bless them with the things that they will be teaching the kids and the things that we will be learning here in the auditorium as well. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd be with the students. Father, give them good and, and active minds to be able to learn more about you to be able to apply the things that are taught to their lives. Father, we pray, especially for George Cummings tonight. Father, we pray a prayer of healing, a prayer of peace. Father, we pray that you'd be with, Penny, with Benny and Pam as well. Bless them with peace. Give them comfort, Father. Father, we pray for all those that are on our prayer list. Father, we pray that you'd bring healing, if it be your will, and that you'd bring peace and comfort where it is needed. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for being our God. It is in your Son, Jesus Christ, holy name we do pray. Amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed. All right, first song is going to be uh, number three. Number three.
Uh, next one will be number 77. 77. Four hundred and eighty, four eight zero. <clears throat> we'll sing the first and third verse on this one. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This is my soul, 
For the for the video, uh, nine fifteen nine one five. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word.
who are truly interested in God's Word, I hope you will invite them to join our Bible study. Richard Dawkins is one of many atheists who has ridiculed Christians for believing in unicorns. He places unicorns in the same category as tooth fairies. Is there such a thing as a unicorn? Why does the King James Version of the Bible talk about unicorns? I'm indebted to others who have put together all the interesting interrelated pieces of this puzzle we'll notice this morning. When you look up the word unicorn in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the first definition recorded reads, a mythical, usually white animal, generally depicted with the body and head of a horse, with long flowing mane and tail, and a single, often spiraled horn in the middle of its forehead. When people today hear the word unicorn, that is ordinarily the image that regularly emerges in their mind. No human has ever witnessed such an animal, and there's never been one discovered in the fossil record. Therefore, atheists and the enemies of Scripture insist the Bible is an unreliable book that promotes fiction and scientific disciplines. But is the one-horned white horse the animal that the Bible speaks about repeatedly? No. Notice the second definition. An animal mentioned in the Bible that is usually considered an aurochs, a one-horned rhinoceros, or an antelope. This secondary definition demonstrates that there is at least some ambiguity concerning which animal the Bible speaks of. This shows, secondly, that the association with the tooth fairy is unnecessary. The reliability of this conclusion becomes even stronger upon further investigation. In Noah Webster's first edition dictionary of 1828, the first definition of the word unicorn is, quote, an animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. This dictionary says nothing about a horse-like animal or a myth mythical animal. It's not in there. Why? Obviously, the modern definition of a white, one-horned, horse-like animal had not been invented in 1828, over 200 years after the King James Version of the Bible appeared with the word unicorn. Instead, the unicorn is equated with a one-horned rhinoceros. Incidentally, the same dictionary points out that the word comes from the Latin unicornis, which literally means one horn. If you're thinking, wait a minute, the rhinoceros has two horns. Please reserve judgment until you hear 
the additional information we'll notice. Now consider that this same 1828 Webster's Dictionary defines the word rhinoceros, which means literally in Latin, nose horn, a genus of quadrupeds or four-legged animals of two species, one of which, the unicorn, has a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. This animal, when fully grown, is said to be 12 feet in length. There is another species, the dictionary continues, with two horns, the bicornus. They are natives of Asia and Africa. Clearly, there were two animals describes, described as rhinoceros, a one-horned animal called a unicorn and a similar animal with two horns called bicornus. In review, less than 200 years ago, a standard dictionary definition of a unicorn pointed to a one-horned rhinoceros, and the definition of rhinoceros pointed to animals, one of which was a one-horned animal called a unicorn. Of even further significance, the scientific name for the Asian one-horned rhinoceros today is the Latin name rhinoceros unicornis, while the black rhinoceros bears the Latin name dicerus bicornis. The Bible says in Psalm 92 verse 10, but my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. That word unicorn is translated unicornus in the Latin Vulgate Bible. Unicornus is the same Latin name used in the scientific name for the one-horned rhinoceros. The King James Version reads in Job 39, verse 9, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? or abide by thy crib? In the Latin Vulgate Bible, the word translated unicorn is rhinoceros in Latin. How about that? In the Latin Vulgate Bible, the Latin translation of the Bible produced over 16 centuries ago, we find the Latin word rhinoceros. That Latin word rhinoceros is translated unicorn in the King James Version of Job 39 verse 9. I understand that five different Latin words are used in the nine different Old Testament instances where we find the word unicorn or unicorns. Rhinoceros, rhinocerotus, rhinocerota, unicornium, and unicornus. In 2003, Eric Dinerstein wrote a book titled The Return of the Unicorns, The Natural History and Conservation of the Greater One-Horned Rhinoceros. Scientists today refer to an extinct animal as the giant unicorn that is merely a one-horned relative of the modern rhinoceros, Elasmotherium sabiricum. Some people believe this is the unicorn mentioned in the Old Testament in places like Job 39, verse 10. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? One writer explains why some Old Testament passages use the Latin word rhinoceros or a derivative, while other scriptures use the Latin word unicornus or unicornium. The context of Psalm 92 verse 10 shows that a single horned rhinoceros is under consideration when the Bible says, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. The word unicorn there comes from the Latin unicornus, or one horn. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 17, however, where Moses is writing about the blessing on Joseph, the context indicates a two-horned rhinoceros. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns, plural, are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Moses tells us that Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are represented by two horns. Interestingly, the footnote by the word unicorns has in my King James Bible, an unicorn. The Hebrew word translated unicorns is actually singular, so it should be rendered unicorn but the word horns is plural and properly translated. So we have plural horns on a single unicorn. But since a unicorn doesn't have two horns, it could not be a unicorn. That's why the Latin does not have 
unicornus, but has rhinoceros, indicating that the two-horned two rhinoceros is in view. The two-horned rhinoceros has a larger horn and a smaller horn. This fits perfectly with the language of Deuteronomy 33, verse 17, where the smaller horn would represent the thousands of Manasseh, and the larger horn would represent the ten thousands of Ephraim. Both of these Bible facts correspond with the prophecy of Joseph's father Jacob in Genesis chapter 48, beginning with verse 17. There the Bible says, And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your hand on his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He, Manasseh, also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother, Ephraim, shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. The Bible statement that Ephraim shall be greater corresponds to the ten thousands of Ephraim further represented, according to Scripture, by the larger horn of the rhinoceros. We see that the Bible's use of the word unicorn is not used to detail a mythical, nonsensical creature but we see that the word unicorn describes what the average person today refers to as a one-horned rhinoceros. And the scientific community would call the rhinoceros unicornus. While we discuss atheistic attempts to ridicule the Bible as an unscientific and even anti-scientific book, let us consider the smear attempt as it relates to the topic of dinosaurs. The question is asked by the skeptic, if the Bible is truly the word of God, why is it completely silent on the topic of dinosaurs? How could scripture be silent on the topic, they say? Additionally, evolutionary scientists claim that dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago, while many Bible believers claim that the earth and everything on it are only thousands of years old. First of all, the first English translation of the Bible appeared in the 1500s, and the translators of the King James Version completed their great work in 1611, over 200 years before anyone ever uttered the word dinosaur. Eric Lyons points out in an apologeticspress.org article that some of what we know from their fossils as dinosaurs today may have been referred to as dragons in the distant past. He writes, Numerous cultures throughout the world possess ancient stories about dragons that closely resemble what we today would call dinosaurs, which is to be expected if dinosaurs and humans actually live together. From ancient texts in Mesopotamia, China, and Europe, Eric Lyons writes, Creatures with scaly skin, slender necks, and long tails are described. In Far Eastern countries such as China, dragons often are described in ancient writings. Some of them are said to have been domesticated and even were used to pull the chariots of Chinese rulers. Also, many of the Chinese people are said to have used dragon bones for special medicines and potions. While visiting the continent of Asia in the 1200s, Italian explorer Marco Polo said that he saw long reptiles called lindworms that easily ran as fast as a horse. In the British Isles, hundreds of dragon stories have come down to the present day. One account told of an animal with a crested head, crested head teeth like a saw, and a long tail. Also in 1449 in England, it was reported that two huge reptiles were seen fighting on the banks of the river Stour. The epic poem Beowulf describes a battle in Denmark between a man named Beowulf and a terrible monster called Grendel. Beowulf was a real person, 
He lived from AD 495 to 583, nearly 1,500 years ago, and was king of a group of people known as the Gatingas. Grindel was a bipedal or two-footed creature that possessed large, powerful jaws and had small, weak forearms. Beowulf slew him, you may recall, by tearing off one of those arms. As Bill Cooper inquired, is there a predatory animal from the fossil record known to us who had two massive hind legs and two comparatively puny forelimbs? There is indeed. Could it be, Lyons writes, Tyrannosaurus rex? Why not? The description of Grindel recorded sometime before the 10th century A.D., over nine centuries before the relatively recent discovery of dinosaur fossils, more closely resembles a Tyrannosaurus rex than any animal alive today. While evolutionary scientists are an atheist, and other skeptics suggest that men could not possibly coexist with such massive, vicious beasts, the same writer also points out that man not only coexists with dinosaur-sized animals, but has managed to a certain extent to domesticate huge, powerful creatures that in a one-on-one -on -one battle with a man by their mere strength and size could squash a man like a bug and or devour him like an evening snack. Lyons writes, whales are the largest animals of which we are aware that have ever existed on the earth, larger than any shark, elephant, or dinosaur. Blue whales have been known to weigh as much as 400,000 pounds, possess a heart the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, and have a tongue large enough to hold 50 people. Yet humans have hunted many species of whales for centuries. Furthermore, whale researchers and photographers have been able to get close enough to touch these massive creatures in the open ocean. Lyon continues, killer whales, also called orcas, are another one of God's magnificent creatures with which we live on the earth. Orcas are one of the ocean's fiercest predators, able even to kill much larger whales, including blue whales, when swimming in packs, referred to as pods. They hunt so well that very few animals can escape their predatory practices. Orcas eat hundreds of thousands of pounds of mammal and fish meat every year. Seals, sea lions, walruses, otters, polar bears, and even a moose have all been found in the stomachs of these ferocious creatures. Amazingly, these incredible killing machines, weighing up to 11,000 pounds, can be captured, tamed, and trained to do all sorts of things. The famous orcas living at the SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida, occasionally take their trainers for rides on their backs. Trainers of orcas even have been known to stick their heads inside the whale's mouths, which usually hold about 40 to 56 large three-inch long teeth without fear of getting bitten. Someone asks, yeah, but what about land animals? Lyons presents the case of the elephant, which weighs well over 100 times as much as the average man does at 22,000 pounds. Over 2,200 years ago, the empire of Carthage, led by its infamous general Hannibal, used tame African elephants to cross the Swiss Alps and battle the Romans. Today, many elephants still are being controlled by man. Tamed elephants are used in various Asian countries in religious ceremonies or to do physical labor like hauling lumber or transporting people from place to place. Elephants also are frequently seen performing at circuses. Amazing, is it not, that humans have trained these creatures which can outweigh them by as much as 20,000 pounds to perform some of the same tricks we train dogs to perform. While the size, strength, and ferocity of many animals today would intimidate us in a one-on-one -on -one battle, God blessed us with enough intelligence and enough physical strength to main control, maintain control over all the animals. The Bible says in Genesis 1, verse 28, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And man has. Skeptics argue that man and dinosaur could not possibly have coexisted. But Eric Lyons resists this conclusion. Ancient paintings, figurines, rock carvings, and other such illustrations also have been found throughout the world that point to a time when dinosaurs and humans once roamed this earth together. One cannot help but wonder if they never did coexist, as evolutionists would have us believe, what logical explanation can be given for the existence of hundreds of dragon legends and the thousands of artifacts that either describe or depict these creatures hundreds or thousands of years before modern man began learning about dinosaurs as a result of the fossil record? And what explanation can be given? What, suggests, what suggestions can be made about what animals are represented by the biblical presentations of Behemoth and Leviathan. We read in Job chapter 40, beginning with verse 15. Look now at the Behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus trees in a covert of reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows of the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes in his mouth. Though he takes it in his eyes, or one pierces his nose with a snare. That's the behemoth. Sounds like a dinosaur to me. Evolutionists suggest that the writer refers to an elephant, rhino, or hippo. One huge problem. This beast moves his tail like a cedar, while the elephant, rhino, and hippo move their tails like little twigs. Meanwhile, fossil records show massive tails for dinosaurs, dinosaurs like the sauropod. The attacks of the skeptics on the holy scriptures are like the beatings of hammers on an anvil. God's word cannot be broken. We've watched or listened to, noticed Bible biology and how it lines up with true biology, the science of Scripture. What's the unicorn? The unicorn was simply a one horn rhinoceros. And dinosaurs? Dinosaurs, um, the word dinosaur didn't come about until the 1800s. So the King James Version that was written in 1611 certainly couldn't have mentioned them. Well, again, God's word cannot be broken. Stay with us for closing words after our song.
Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. Contact us for a free copy of number 1184 Bible Biology. You may also request our new Bible course, The Truth Frees, at no cost to you. Gain rapid access to audio, video. Well, that makes me feel better. Remember, I, a few weeks ago, I talked about that little book I found at United, the scientific study in the Bible. Same stuff there. So where the Bible speaks, it's the truth. As always, if there's anything we can do for anybody, let us know. We can meet after church if we need to or whatever you might need. I see Grady in the back. We forgot one announcement. He's still doing first aid CPR, right? CPR AED. He's working on a scheduling for June, maybe? End of June. He wants about 12 people per class. So he's going to use the family center. And I'll tell you what, that's a lifesaver. So get with him if you got any questions. We'll get signed up and and we'll go from there. It's, yes, it's for the community, for everybody. And it's free. Best part. Can't beat that. If you're lucky, he might bring a cinnamon roll. If Kenneth Ware's not there. So, let's pray. Our Father, we come before you and we just give you thanks. Lord, when we hear lessons like that, they just, they just remind us of how true the Bible is and it is your word. There's skeptics out there every day trying to attack what you teach, what you tell us. And yet the Bible itself, Lord, it proves that you are real. Lord, everything we have, we know it comes from you. And we thank you for that. Tonight, Lord, we have some on our list who are sick, who are needing some assistance. We pray for George and we pray for Benny and Pam and comfort them. Give them what they need. Give the medical professionals the training, the technology, the skills they need to, to take care of George. And we know it's going to be a long road, Lord, and we just pray that you're with them. Lord, there are those that we don't even know about. You know about them and we don't. Or there's those in the audience, Lord, that know somebody. Lord, answer the prayers. Comfort. Heal if it's your will. And when it's the time to bring them home, Lord, give us all comfort. Lord, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, who died for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen.